Bullseye with Jesse Thorne is a production of MaximumFun.org and is distributed by NPR. Coming to you from my house in Los Angeles, it's Bullseye. I'm Jesse Thorne. Well, folks, what you're about to hear is an interview with Tina Fey and Robert Carlock, two of my actual comedy heroes. They co-created 30 Rock, of course, a show that revolutionized TV comedy, a show with more great jokes per minute than basically anything that came before it, a show that still might be the funniest thing ever to run on TV, and a show that, for better or worse, immortalized the phrase, I want to go to there. After it ended in 2011, Faye and Carlock followed up 30 Rock with Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. You know that show, right? The sitcom about a woman who spent much of her childhood captive in a bunker run by a cult leader. It's also hilarious and brilliant. The Pats is not a root beer, Kimmy Schmidt. I don't care. I spent 15 years in that bunker eating beans out of a Florida Marlins cap. The Marlins, Titus. <gasps> Ooh, there. That noise. The way you're looking at me. Like I'm a freak. Step right up and see the mole woman. She made a pet cat out of dryer lint in a Gershner's bag. <gasps> Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt wrapped its fourth and final season early last year, but it's back. Tina and Robert reunited the cast for a special called Kimmy vs. the Reverend. And in it, you get to decide Kimmy's fate. It's interactive, like a choose-your-own-adventure book, but on TV. Should Titus, her roommate, take an Uber or walk, for example? Does Kimmy want to make out with her guy or plan her wedding? And what kind of wedding dress will Kimmy wear? Oh, yes, uh, Kimmy is getting married to a fancy prince, played by Daniel Radcliffe. Now, this is the fancy option, like what Mrs. Peanut would get married in. You think Mr. Peanut is straight? And this is the other option. But that one's just fun, like a pool float shaped like a piece of pizza. <laughs> what? And your wedding is in three days and you haven't chose the dress yet? I know I'm being silly. Thank you for being so patient with me. Don't thank her, you're rich now. And rich people can do whatever we want. <laughs> oh, brother, this is hard. How do you choose between fancy and fun? Why choose just cut the butt out of the fancy one? Best of both worlds. I say, don't pick the fun one. If you think something's fun, it's going to be dumb and for babies. And I'm going to go with the fancy one. Titus, you're right. My wedding's going to be so fudging elegant, even a penguin's going to feel underdressed. And I invited four, so... There you go, hon. Pizza cake! Tina Fey, Robert Carlock, welcome to Bulls. I'm so happy to have the two of you on the show. So thrilled about it. Thank you for having us. Happy to be here. Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt ended with an ending, but there was always, there had been bandied about the possibility that there was going to be a movie. How did Maybe We Could Tell Another Story in This World turn into Maybe We Could Write a Television Choose Your Own Adventure novel? Well, I think the uh, the idea of doing an interactive special came from Netflix. Bef they came to us with that uh, idea before we wrapped the series. And so I think Robert and I were just kept calling it a movie. And then somebody finally was like, "It's stop calling it that. <laughs> it's an interactive special. <laughs> we can't call it Choose Your Own Adventure either, legally, Jesse. So. <laughs> so that's what we were talking about. And we got to see, you know, it was pretty cool. They, they came to us, uh, I guess, a, a few months before Bandersnatch came out and said, we have this technology. We're going to show you this thing on a, you know, secret link. And they showed us Bandersnatch and they're like, do you think you would be interested in doing a comedy version of this with the Kimmy characters? And one, we were mostly just so excited because we wanted to keep the cast and crew together and have and be able to delay our goodbyes from each other. Uh, but also it just was really cool. Um, and we thought it would be really fun to write a comedy version of that stuff. Was it hard to figure out what is funny about that? I think that was the easy part in some ways. Making it all knit together was the really hard part. I mean, there's always this tension in comedy about how far can you go with the, for the joke or to set up the, the comic tension in a story or, or a situation. And this allowed us to go really far with those things and then be able to back up without having sold out the characters. 
I mean, the thing that's really, that seems like it would be the big challenge in making this for this show in particular is that Kimmy Schmidt is as dense a comedy as exists on television, right? Like it's a, there's a thousand million jokes in an episode of Kimmy Schmidt and you have to write among other things, time for people to choose a choice when a choice comes up. I mean, you write them into jokes, but like it really does alter the, you know, there are a few shows with as much forward momentum in which the viewer is as swept up in them as Kimmy Schmidt. And so it is a very different dynamic. Yes. I think, you know, originally those choice points, we were writing them in the same way with people like while the choice points were up, there were all kinds of jokes continuing and jokes that were about things that had nothing to do with the choice point. And it was kind of an editorial decision to be like, we need to be, we need to be kind to people and give them a fighting shot at <laughs> at making a choice and figure and staying with us. So it we did punitive. scale. Yeah. Yeah. We scaled back <laughs> around those moments and hopefully found some performance and, you know, like Titus is being funny with his face or Jane sucking on that iced coffee for way too long. But that is a change up pitch in our universe. Yes. And and I think definitely for the best. I mean, it was something that we discovered even when we were doing the regular series. Sometimes, you know, Netflix doesn't have a time uh, limit and we would have episodes that would get close to a half an hour, even over, and they felt long. So when we looked at this and said, well, the viewing experience is, is something between you know an hour and three hours, we need to have these moments where you take a breath or it's just going to be relentless. I mean, I know people who have had that reaction to your shows as they existed before. Like they say, like really excited. They're like, oh, it was relentless. I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I think once in a while I meet somebody who can't watch them 30 rock and kimmy schmidt because (laughs) because the like pace and jokes are too intense like they try and express this to me in sympathetic terms because they know how much i care about these shows but like the intensity is 12 out of 10 you know yeah yeah yes sorry tino it's (laughs) (laughs) it's an ongoing uh conversation but (laughs) <laughs> one thing we did find with the editing of this was we and what ended up being great about the interactive format was in spots where we really had such a density of jokes we were especially in the sort of the first act of the of the special we were able to say like let's pair some of these jokes away or some of these options away so we can get people onto the adventure but then we can use computer programming and our editor Kyle Gelman is a fantastic editor and also thank goodness was skilled at computer programming because he figured out a lot of ways he's like well i can program it so that if you go back and you're watching this scene the computer the program can tell if you're watching the scene for a second time and it will change the jokes so we were able to pare down some jokes believe it or not and and but not lose them just kind of shuffle them like a deck of cards what was the toughest part of doing it i mean shooting it was challenging because we had to get 150 some 60 some pages in like 21 days or something yeah, it was, like that. It was packed, yeah. But I think editing was the trickiest in terms of you're not thinking linearly anymore. You're not saying, oh, well, if we lift this, I know the one thing it affects, or, oh, we can lift it without affecting anything. When we were making decisions and trying to figure out, thankfully, with Kyle's help and with our co writers, Sam Means and Meredith Scardino, when you're making decisions that affect all these branches and branches and versions, uh, it's a different part of your brain. Did you know what you wanted it to be? The the themes of this uh, movie or episode or whatever you want to call it are very deeply tied in with the themes of the show as a whole, but also with this particular medium. There are decision points that are goofy jokes, but there are also decision points that really have to do with the biggest themes in the show. Did you know how you wanted to marry this unusual format to those big themes right away? I'm really trying to avoid spoilers here. I'm doing my best. I think I'm doing okay. Oh, I appreciate it. 
I think we, we, you know, it was the four of us wrote it. It was me and Robert and Meredith Scardino and Sam Means wrote it. Normally uh, for the series, we would write with a larger staff, but in, in some ways it was, it was really fun to have it f- focused, smaller group. We found the tent poles pretty quickly, right? We, right. I think because we, I think we knew we wanted something that felt cinematic in scale because we kept incorrectly calling it a movie. Uh, and the idea of like Kimmy tracking down some stuff that the Reverend may have done based on stuff that she finds like that, that size story came to us pretty quickly. And then the idea of her, you know, finally having a a romantic life was something that we had put aside. We didn't really want to deal with that in the end of the series. We felt it was kind of too expected, but it, it kind of goes nicely as an opposite to this other adventure. And I think it was a benefit too, knowing this thing was a possibility while we were ending the series, uh, because, the series had dealt with Kimmy's romantic optimism, but that didn't feel like the right place to end her finding a, a partner and finding someone else uh, was, because the series was so much about her uh, personal strength. And similarly, it didn't feel like we had fully plumbed everything we could do with the Reverend, but we also didn't want to end with the Reverend. We didn't want his shadow uh, sort of over the end of the series. So we kind of intentionally held back on some things and told a different and we think fitting ending for the series and then uh, had these other things to play with that, as Tina said, I think go well in, in the way that we hopefully successfully always were trying to balance dark and light in, in the series. The show originally came from the star, Ellie Kemper, right? That the two of you were, it was suggested to you, maybe you would want to do something with her. We developed backwards from her, which is a, a kind of how we like to work. And we played with some other ideas besides this. We, we, at one point, she was a woman waking up from a coma, I think. Right, Tina? Yeah, or she was a baby who had fallen down a well. Right, right. But all leaning into the kind of combination of strength and wide-eyed openness that she projects in, in a unique way. What did you know of her work when you started writing it? She had been on The Office at that point and was a kind of a big deal in the improv world. But how did you know her? Yeah, I mean, I didn't know her personally very well, but I knew her from The Office and uh, from Bridesmaids. And she was so charming in that. And I'm wondering, maybe I had met her because I also just knew that she was a lovely person. I think we both had a sense of like, this is a person who will be great to work with and for. Yeah, I'm great at discovering people after they're on other shows. I remember seeing her on The Office and thinking, <laughs> oh, she's great, as if Allison Jones and Greg Daniels hadn't already found her. I did the same thing with Chris Pratt. I remember calling Dave Miner, who is Tina's manager and one of our producers, and he was on Parks and Rec. And I was like, we, I want to develop for him. I was like, yeah, he's going to do a Marvel franchise. Congratulations on discovering Chris Pratt. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when the show was announced and I was a huge Ellie Kemper fan and a huge fan of both of yours. And I thought, well, that isn't that wonderful that they're, that they're all working together. I heard the synopsis and I thought, holy cow, that is a big swing for a sitcom. Yeah. How did you approach the challenge of taking a, a, a story that at its heart is about horrific trauma and making a fast paced, goofy generally lighthearted sitcom out of it at the beginning when you, when you were first trying to figure out how the, how those puzzle pieces fit together. Yeah. Well, you know, the original, original pilot was much darker and it was originally made for NBC. Uh, there was a, an order of 13 episodes for NBC and around when we were shooting episode, you know, 11 or 12, NBC was like, we don't really, these are great. We don't really know where we'll put them. Like, maybe we'll just put them on in the summer after America's Got Talent. And we were like, I don't think that's some. <laughs> maybe we'll just put the episodes in a suitcase and throw the suitcase in the water. Yeah. And so uh, our one of our agents, Richard White's, uh, famous now for Richard White's quarantunes, um, he he was very astute and said, like, why don't we call people at Netflix and see if they would be interested in this thing that no one's seen? And thank goodness they were. Now, I bring that up only to say that that original Dark Pilot, had it been made for Netflix, they probably would have been like, great. But there's something about what you can make on a streaming platform. And there is, I don't blame NBC, there is something different about when you're putting stuff in a half hour comedy slot on on broadcast TV, you know, at 8, 8.30, 9 o'clock at night. 
you're going you're going into people's homes kind of uninvited as opposed to being chosen on a streaming service. So we we reshot a bunch of the pilot to figure out how I don't know how to that was you know how to help people get on board with the tone. Um, and then we and us figuring it out as we went a little bit. I mean, yeah. I think some of that reshooting was just a question of lighting. Some of it was a question of completely rewriting scenes. Yeah. I mean, it's not uncommon to reshoot part of a pilot, but yeah. it was always, the thought was always like, we, there's a lot of, or my, and Robert's thought anyway, was there's a lot of, a lot of television made about victims of crimes and things that happen. And it's usually made in a kind of titillating under the guise of procedural way. And, or we think of how many movies are about murderers and, and bad people. And I was like, could we, could we possibly just tell this person's story in a way that, let's her story not be defined by what happened to her. And that was the attempt. It seems like it was really important to you to emphasize that Kimmy Schmidt was not only the central character narratively, but that she had agency in her own life, that she wasn't a, you know, a compliment to, you know, frankly, the, the men in the story. Uh, that, that's thank you. You articulated that better than we did. Um, yeah, I think we've always thought of the series that was the core was that it was her story and also the story of how connection, interaction with her changed those other three characters for the better. How do you decide on this show uh, what is too insane to put on television? Well, <laughs> we talked about it a lot. <laughs> I'm not sure we ever set the parameters. Uh, <laughs> season two, a, a character reached some kind of uh, complaining culture apotheosis and turned into a beam of light and <laughs> disappeared. And when we started, I did not think we would do that. And I'm no. now wondering why that had slipped I don't, through. I don't know. It's sort of like, I mean, that, that particular episode was written in such a... Um, angry self-aware uh, kind of, well, uh, yeah, yeah and like provocative, <laughs> provocative way yeah i you know usually the the rules would be just like it can be sound crazy if there's even one thread by which you could connect it to any kind of reality for example the idea that the yukos the robots are in the world are based on like things that are being built and starting to be used around the world um and so usually usually there's one at least tenuous thread of connection but um yeah ashton splode like rising from <laughs> From a, <laughs> rising like a vampire, that lit, person turning into a beam of light. There definitely are some, some, uh, <laughs> the, you know, I think for me, it's always like you start, you start like uh, trying to hold on to some boundaries, kind of knowing that they will eventually be stripped away by <laughs> strong winds. <laughs> um, the winds I mean, of desperation. To, yeah. To me, like, there's there, sure there are like crazy, fantastical narrative things here and there. I mean, most of the last season of the show uh, and in this film, uh, Kimmy does a lot of talking to her talking backpack. But like, to me, even more than that, like, I think of there, there's an episode where uh, Titus goes on an audition, forgets the song he's supposed to sing, and improvises <laughs> yeah. a song about toothpaste that yeah, has had, the line. He had a fever, Jesse. He yeah. had a fever. Uh, <laughs> teeth are outside bone. Never forget teeth outside are outside bones. bones. Outside bones. Never forget your teeth, teeth are outside bones. Teeth are bones that hang from your lips like bats. <laughs> they get stolen by a demon that your parents know. To, to make it less weird. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and like, I think I like paused it at that point and got like a, you know, when a dog gets the zoomies, like when their little brain <laughs> overflows and they run around the circle, run around the house in a circle, you know, I think I did that around my coffee table at, at the end of the demon your parents know. <laughs> and yet there's some people that you, you claim to have found people that don't want to watch that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, was was part of the pleasure in making this show for Netflix and not for ne uh, network television that to some extent you are really making it for people who have chosen to watch it. And so you don't have to feel guilty about doing something that they would like. Yes, you have to sort of police yourself a little bit 
possibly a little bit more than we did. But um, yeah, it is it is very freeing to be able to go, okay, people are people are coming to this because they are choosing it and we're not kind of having to win them over every every week. They're here on purpose. Jan the backpack, I will say, was one of the ones that I was like, I remember we pitched it right up and I was like, I don't know. I don't know about this. And I will say that I have met several people, including my, you know, uh, my friend, Jim, Robert, he, he really likes yeah. Jan and he's a person who I, I suspect he really doesn't like things like outside bones. And he really, he's like, I, Jan made me cry. I love Jan. I was like, great. I'm glad I lost <laughs> the that one battle. time I was right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, did you start with actors when you were casting the show or did you start with characters and cast actors to them? Well, we started with Ellie. And and we made what ended up being a, a, an ingenious move of naming the character Titus because we had Titus in mind. Uh, he had worked for us on 30 Rock and we thought it was hilarious, but we didn't know the full set of his skills. And we auditioned people, including Titus, for that. So thank God he booked it. Yeah, Titus had to audition for the role of Titus. <laughs> it's, it's idiotic. Why, why, yeah. why, do, why do that? I, I remember seeing him on 30 Rock. And, you know, a lot of sitcom guest stars are from the general kind of improv comedy world. And, and they're like people I know and recognize. I had never seen him before in my life. He was a Broadway star who had starred in Guys and Dolls on Broadway. And... I was like, this is the funniest man I've ever seen on television. <laughs> and he has six lines in this episode of 30 Rock. He yeah. is so infinitely funny and talented. And we he was just, yeah, he was a day player on 30 Rock. We just saw him on a tape and we're like, great, that guy seems good. And um, I think that was his first on-camera job ever. And we had no idea that he even had that Broadway background. And it wasn't until, this, I remember the series 30 Rock was over and we were in these little offices where we were developing a new show. And I got this CD in the mail that was like, Titus, you know, I thought I'd send you my CD. And I was sort of like, oh, brother, what's this going to be? And then I put it in and he's like <laughs> the greatest singer I've ever heard. And then I was like <laughs> looking him up and I was like, oh my God, I had no idea. And I think that was partly why we... And we thought of him while we were developing this. I'm just like, this guy's so crazy talented. And that's how you end up with outside bones. When someone has infinite abilities, you say, okay, we can do this. Yeah. <laughs> you For you need to Ill. be able to, you need to have powerful wings to fly too close to the sun. Is that what <laughs> yes. you're suggesting? Yeah. We flew past the sun, Jesse. <laughs> we flew right through the sun. Came out with new carbon wings. <laughs> We'll wrap up my interview with Tina Fey and Robert Carlock after a quick break. Still to come, now that Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt has wrapped, they're working on two more shows, two brand new shows. I'll ask them how they do it. It's Bullseye from MaximumFun.org and NPR. Let's all close our eyes, take a deep breath, let it out, and listen to NPR's All Songs Considered. It's a music podcast, but it's also a good friend and guide to find joy in troubled times. Hear All Songs Considered with new episodes every Tuesday and Friday, wherever you listen to podcasts. Hi, I'm Renee Colbert. I'm Alexis Preston. And we're the hosts of the smash hit podcast, Can I Pet Your Dog? Now, Alexis. Yes. We got big news. Uh-oh. Since last we did a promo, our dogs have become famous. World famous. World, like, stars on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Second big news. Mm -hmm. The reviews are in. Mm-hmm. Take yourself to Apple Podcasts. You know what you're going to hear? We're happy. It's true. We're a delight. A great distraction from the world. I like that part a lot. So if that's what you guys are looking for, mm -hmm. you got to check out our show. But what else can they expect? We've got dog tech, dog news, celebrities with their dogs, all dog things. All the dog things. So if that interests you, well, get yourself on over to Maximum Fun every Tuesday. It's Bullseye. I'm Jesse Thorne. This week, my guests are two comedy legends, Tina Fey and and Robert Carlock. They co-created the show's 30 Rock and Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. There's a new chapter in Kimmy Schmidt's story, an interactive special called Kimmy vs. the Reverend. You can stream it now on Netflix. Let's get back into our conversation. How did the two of you start working together? We met at Saturday Night Live. Um, we were writers there, and I, I got there in 97. You, did you, were you 96, Robert? Or were you... I was not, not 96, yeah. And then uh, when Jimmy and I started anchoring Weekend Update, Robert was the writer-producer of that segment. Robert, what does that mean logistically? Like, what's the job of the writer-producer of Weekend Update? Weekend Update functions a little bit as its own 
fiefdom, we could get away with things. Lauren wasn't really paying attention as much. It's your own little 10 minutes. Uh, it, it could be an intense experience. You know, you're trying to do something on Saturday that none of the other shows have done during the week. At the time, it was Leno, Letterman, Daily Show. Uh, so that was those Friday nights through Saturday nights uh, was an annealing experience working with Tina, just realizing how funny and how smart uh, and how hardworking she is. Uh, Thanks, Robert. That was a good time. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, we had some fun. Tina, was there something particular that interested you in Robert and the his work and the way he worked? Uh, I liked Robert's sort of Germanic coldness and his precision. <laughs> You're giving the Germans a bad name. <laughs> Listen, the Germans are doing pretty good in this pandemic thing. Yeah. Yeah, I just thought he was, you know, always working at the top of his intelligence and and had a good work ethic, which not everybody does at SNL. Some people really zing it in last minute. And so we just always kind of uh, worked well together. I think we challenge each other in a good way. I think we um, are, you know, inspired by the other two continue to try to like work harder, especially in our 20s and 30s. <laughs> You're like, all right, I'll work as hard as you. Can either of you give me an example of a time that uh, the other one challenged you? Well, I mean, I think all these shows, when we're writing these shows, I don't think challenge in a bad way, but I think we, you know, we ask each other questions during a rewrite of like, does this track, does this make sense? Could we do this better here? You know, uh, I think we just hold each other to a very high standard. Could, uh, can you think of a specific incident, Robert? I'm, I'm trying to. I mean, it's kind of, uh, and again, I... I don't want this to sound the wrong way. It's kind of constant. I mean, that's what the <laughs> collaboration is, is this, is this back and forth. Uh, I think we always look at the other person's writing or work, or whether it's coming from a room of other writers and pitching something or it's something on the page with a lot of respect, but, but with a different point of view, uh, even though there's a lot of overlap in the Venn diagram of what we think is funny or appropriate or, or worth writing about. Um, but it's, I think it's a, constant mistrust. No, it, it's a constant, uh, I feel like that's my job and that's what I expect from Tina is when I bring her something, she's going to make it better. Yeah, same. Did the two of you scheme on what you could do outside of Saturday Night Live together when you were at Saturday Night Live? I think we thought we were just going to work there forever. Robert left to go work at Friends. I, I, yeah. Yeah, I didn't know there was anything outside of Saturday Night Live. And uh, it just doesn't occur to you. It's such a all-consuming lifestyle. It's not just a job. Uh, but I always wanted to tell stories and I wanted to go learn how to do that and, and um, didn't think I would leave when I left, but uh, but I did. I mean, you got offered a job on Friends. You could yeah. do a lot worse. Yeah, yeah. But I just hadn't... I'm, I'm amazed that I did. They were very open-minded. I didn't have a spec. I had a, had a bunch of stuff from SNL. I think they were looking for joke writing more than storytelling. And I went and wrote a lot of jokes and learned how to do story there. What did you learn that you didn't know? You know, that's a show that I think is probably seen because it's so easily digested and the actors and characters are so charming and so good. It is seen as a sort of facile show, I think. They were very diligent about structure and can stories dovetail thematically or, or otherwise? And uh, how do the stories build? How does the see just the basics, the nuts and bolts of, is this scene moving the story forward and funny do people have different points of view in it all, all the questions that we try to ask day to day when you've got 21 and a half minutes you need to know the rules and then if you're going to try to play with them you really need to know the rules that was a show that played by the rules it's interesting to me that like two of your big early career jobs robert outside of saturday night live were friends which is one of if not the most successful sitcom ever and was, you know, widely beloved, extraordinarily successful, and sometimes seen as facile. Um, and uh, the Dana Carvey show, which right. was maybe the weirdest, most upsetting show that's ever been on network television. And I say that as someone who, <laughs> at the time, when it was on television, watched every episode. <laughs> like, it was, I God couldn't believe it was real and was like, would, you know, go to the yard in high school and talk to my friend John King. Can you believe that they did that? <laughs> Wasn't that beautiful? 
like the furthest poles. And that show also really was profoundly unsuccessful. <laughs> Um, <laughs> like very publicly unsuccessful in a way publicly that, like, unsuccessful with like 19 million people watching it but yeah but when it was between two shows that were being watched by 26 million people it was unsuccessful and it was just fundamentally it received apart from weirdos like you and your, your friend received negatively <laughs> What was it like to operate in these, in these, you know, those are all big time, those three jobs, uh, Dana Carvey show, Friends and Saturday Night Live are all big time show business jobs. They're all the top of the heap. And I am very proud of you. I hope you are proud of yourself for having those jobs at the beginning of your career. But yeah, (laughs) (laughs) but uh, they're also like three completely different poles of the world of comedy and comedy writing. So what was it what was it like to have those hugely disparate experiences right at the start of your career wow uh the difference between saturday night live and friends both being places i came into as a guest right that's now has been around since time began and, and i was there for the last three years of friends i was definitely there to learn but you could show up at snl i don't know what episode for you tina you got your first sketch on it's probably your very first one, I think it was my third. And it's okay, go produce it. Go talk to the actors, go talk to set design, go talk to these guys who've won Tony Awards and tell them what it should look like and tell them what it should be. And you go to friends and you're very much in the writer's room. We're on the floor and we pitch jokes, uh, but the the interaction is very different. I wasn't a producer there by any means. Uh, whereas I just hung around long enough and I was producing Weekend Update. And you know, not only dealing with Tina and Jimmy directly, uh, but, you know, getting the late, wonderful Hal Wilner to, to call Lou Reed and have him show up for a bit. Yeah. Um, get so spoiled there. It, you get so spoiled and you don't realize it. Of course, when you're there, all you do is complain. Um, so I was, it was a very different, I approached friends very differently. I knew I was there to learn how to write story and, to, to make myself worthwhile and to prove to myself that I could do that kind of show. And then the Dana Carvey show, I didn't, I mean, I was 23 years old and I, all I was aware of was how incredibly talented everyone around me was. And I thought if this is what the business is like, uh, I'm not going to make it. Fortunately, most people <laughs> are terrible and I surround myself with them to make myself feel good. Uh, but yeah, I was sitting next in a desk in a room with John Glazer and Charlie Kaufman mm-hmm. and Charlie was, between writing sketches was writing being John Malkovich. Uh, wow. And I thought, good luck with that. Uh, but, uh, and then you've got, you know, Louis and Robert Heigl and uh, Steve Carell and Steve Colbert. It's it, ridiculous. Murderer's Row. Um, and it failed. I mean, that was a great experience, great lesson. The eighth episode never aired. Jeez. <laughs> Did the two of you have like a scheme, a manifesto, an idea of what kind of show you wanted to make when you got the opportunity to make 30 Rock? Well, 30 Rock, I wrote the pilot. I wrote a couple of versions of the pilot uh, for NBC. And then when we finally got one that was going to get made, I called Robert and Mike Schur and said, "Can you co- would you guys be willing to come out for like two weeks and just hang out and help me uh, punch up this pilot and help me? on set shooting it because I have never done a pilot before. So they both came, which was so great and awesome and helped for a couple weeks. And then, and I think, you know, Mike was already busy or something, but Robert friends was over and, or Joey was over. Right. And, um, I, when the pilot got picked up, I said, you know, I don't know how many of these we'll make, you know, they're making studio 60, but would you and Jen, Robert's wife, would you guys be willing to move back here temporarily and, and help out some more, be a EP on it. And they were like, sure. And they, I think you, I'm sure you guys were like, sure, but we'll leave milk in the fridge in California. <laughs> in Studio 60 had every billboard on the Sunset Strip. We're like, this is not going to work. Um, and so that said, you know, once we actually got started on it, we, we, yeah, we, we, th- they were really exciting first days. And there was an office we had on 54th street that was like, uh, when we were going, finally writing beyond the pilot, it was me and Robert and John Regi and Jack Burdett and Kay Cannon. And, um, who else was there that first season Daisy? Um, but it, you know, it was so thrilling to sit there and try to pitch stories on a show that, um, nobody was really paying that much attention to and that, um, ev- nothing had been done yet. Like we didn't have that problem of like, oh, we did that already. And so it was really like things were coming together fast and furious. And I think tonal- tonally, 
we just kind of found it as we went. Like we kind of felt like we just found it over the course of the first season, which I think is sort of typical for, for series that you sort of lock in by episode six, seven, eight. Although there, I mean, episodes like episode two or three, what is jacked or there's some, really, they're really good episodes in the beginning, but if you go back to them, they don't feel the same as episode one thirteen, say. Right. Did you ever feel like successes when you were making it? Did we feel like successes? Yeah. I think we were, we were pretty stoked around, <laughs> especially like that. <laughs> we were first, we were just happy. That was that feeling of like, we filmed this and we'll always have a tape of it. We'll always have these yeah. tapes. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, after that first year when we... You bought a bunch of boats. I bought so many boats. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they're all at the bottom of the Hudson now. <laughs> but then, yeah, then we, we used to win. I mean, we, we there was a window of time that I'm not going to pretend wasn't really fun when we, we used to go to awards things and pick up our prizes and party with the people from Mad Men. Like, it was a great time. <laughs> <laughs> that was fun. Then we get pizza at the Four Seasons. Yeah. <laughs> Tina, did you like being a f- famous person and the face <laughs> of the show and like a movie star and stuff? Like, was that something <laughs> you uh, you wanted or not? I'm not asking you, like, did you like earning money or like right. gifting sweets or whatever? Any Any idiot would like that. But like, I think I sometimes wonder, like, is part of this just... Well, I accidentally got famous on Weekend Update because I have distinctive eyeglasses, and if I want to have my own, if I want to have my own television show, I can leverage the fact that I'm kind of famous and and be in the middle of it rather than I want to star in a television show. Yeah, well, I think um, you know I was in the uh, the catbird seat. I, I I definitely had the experience of writing for SNL and having a great time, but there was always a part of your brain you'd be sitting there as a writer, like stewing in your own filth and you'd see the women women in the cast pass through you'd be stuck at the rewrite table and they're like bye guys we're they're like all dressed up with professional hair and makeup they're like we have to leave early we're going to vh1 divas live or something and you'd be like i want to go to that i don't want to be at this rewrite table um so it was uh, absolutely as a privilege to be able to do both and i was always a person like i was an actor but i never booked anything um and also I don't, the times I've done things that weren't something that I helped make, it is, it is not, uh, as satisfying. So to be able to be on that show that I'm so proud of and that we wrote as well, that, yeah, that was a perfect experience, you know, cause I could be in an edit room and I'm just as happy to see, you know, a Tracy joke, probably even more happy to see a joke, a Tracy joke or, or a Jack Donaghy joke that I helped pitch on or something like that's just as fun for me as just to be the one talking. But it's not bad to get to be one of the ones talking. What I like about this is that you took a look at the life of a Hollywood star from just outside that mm-hmm. world. You know, you saw people going to VH1 Divas Live <laughs> and you thought, like, I think most people would think that looks a lot easier and more glamorous than sitting here in this rewrite room. I should switch to mm-hmm. that. You thought, I should add an additional job to my life. <laughs> well, yeah, I do think that it is kind of glamorous, but it, they ha- actors have no control of over what they get to say, over what parts they get. You know, it's 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 unpleasant for them a lot of times. You know, they get they don't get to do something because of the way they do or don't look or how old they are, and so it definitely is. You're definitely in a better position if you're creating stuff for yourself. What did it mean to work on 30 Rock for years? And despite the fact that it, you know, parts during parts of that time, Tina, you were literally a movie star and you had, you were co-starring with two other movie stars <laughs> on this show in Alec Baldwin yeah. and Tracy Morgan. And yet the show felt like it was on the verge of ending at all times. Yeah, the show was often... I will say, to quote Chris Rock, it's not like porn. Not everyone in it is a star. I was a movie participant. <laughs> 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 but, uh, I mean, those things were, like, jammed in on the summers. But, yeah, 30 Rock was held together by, like, gum and force of will for a couple years just because people were doing stuff or people were unhealthy or getting in trouble and um it uh we had more we just had more energy then didn't we robert yeah i i feel like we still work hard but it is 
<laughs> what we did then was ridiculous. I mean, it's not it's not real work. But twenty two episodes of network television com- opposed to uh, thirteen episodes of streaming or some shows are like yeah. eight. Ricky Gervais has never worked a hard day in his life. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> <laughs> so rich. <laughs> Do you guys have a lifestyle that is manageable? I think you have a reputation for having a late working writer's room on these shows, adding these 20,000 jokes to things. We've gotten better about that because we've just got more kids now between us two and your kids just kind of won't have it after a while. And we don't, we don't stay up all night anymore. Yeah. I think we've gotten better at making decisions earlier and, uh, it's it's hard though. You want it to be as good as it possibly can be, uh, but having kids affects things a lot. Best thing that'll ever ruin your mm-hmm. life. Did the two of you who have been making this kind of show now for fifteen years or whatever it's been, maybe even a little more than that, are you at a point where you sit down together when you're thinking of something new and think, "Man, we have really." figured out what we like doing and uh, what we're good at? Or do you feel like the two of you sit down together and think, God, can we think of something else, some other kind of thing to make so that we don't have to think of all these jokes anymore? (laughs) I think that the joke part is is not the hard part. I think, you know, I will say back to this Kimmy Interactive that that was, I felt like us coming into that felt like, I, we, I thought we felt as a very unified team, the four of us, and very conditioned and muscles ready to write all those jokes for those characters and to break that insanely uh, interwoven story. Like that, I felt like, okay, this is us. This is our prayer for Owen Meany moment. We know how to do this. Um, beyond that, I don't know. We, we do we do have another show that we're shooting that got interrupted, uh, of course, now because of the shutdown, but... I don't know. So far, we haven't run out of things. Robert, have we? Not quite, but it is always... I do always feel like there's a certain spur of, like, how is this going to be different as opposed to how do we keep making widgets? Maybe we should be widget makers, yeah. maybe. <laughs> <laughs> we should do We should do a procedural. <laughs> we should just be like, let's just make, like, one fabulous episode and then the other nine are a mess. <laughs> That's a template that seems to work. Do the two of you still like each other? You answer first. I love to. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. We're family yeah. friends. Our, our kids know each other. We hang yeah. out. I mean, not now. <laughs> no. Do you hang out? Like, I've, I've, been doing a, I've been doing a comedy show with my friend for 20 years, and somewhere around year four, we stopped socializing. <laughs> <laughs> like, we're still, like, I still consider him one of my closest friends and love him to death. Like, it's, uh, there's been very little static in that 20 years. But uh, I think it just ended up that it was like, we only have so much juice for being around each other. We better put it towards work. Yeah, you're around each other all the time. Like, that might be enough. That might be a- enough time to hear what everyone's up to. <laughs> How is it for the two of you? I think so far so good. I mean, again, we have in, in, in normal times, we're all in the office together and we have what we refer to as host chat where we hear how everybody's doing. And, and yeah, host chat on Zoom has been uh, a little dry. No one's doing anything. Yeah, no one has anything to report. <laughs> no one's talking about their sourdough starter. I feel like everybody wants to talk about their sourdough oh, starter. Only. I made pretzels today. If you guys oh, need to talk about good. something, how'd, how'd just, that come out? They came out pretty good. I did them in uh, I did them in baking soda water instead of lye mm. water. There's two ways, two very hyper basic waters that you can boil huh. them in to make the outside crisp huh. up and the inside be chewy. Huh. Anyway, just just some if if you need something yeah. for later. Fun anecdote: Public radio host told me about his pretzels. So you weren't so you weren't preparing for this earlier. No, not at all. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so you're you have uh two new shows that have just recently been announced uh one a live action show with ted danson and holly hunter and, and bobby moynihan and one an animated show how can you manage those things and also manage your human lives and also manage the horror that surrounds us at all times now well i mean how does uh. anyone how is anyone successfully 
getting focusing and getting their work done uh, at the moment. We're all just kind of doing our best, but at least our work does sometimes feel like an escape. Yeah, uh, we are lucky in that way. Yeah. Um, and these shows, yeah, we, these shows were, they were carefully stacked not to overlap with each other. And now that's all gonna, <laughs> you know, they're all going to re rear end each other for lack of a better term, but we'll just figure it out as we go. I think the animated show is, is Robert and Sam Means created that show and they're going to, you start Monday, Robert? Yep. Amazing. Um, yep. And... We're producing a show called Girls 5 Eva, and we're producing this show called Mr. Mayor for NBC with Ted Danson, and that's the one that we were shooting. So that's the one that, you know, when when the world does reopen safely, we will go back to shooting that. The nice thing, the animated one is, I think animators, that's a, a world that can keep moving more than live action. Right. What did you work backwards from when you found out you were going to be doing that show with... Ted Danson. It had a, a, that was came out of a long development process that for a long time looked like it was going to involve Alec Baldwin, who's a very yeah. different performer. You know, slightly older than middle aged white dudes is pretty much all they have in and good at comedy is pretty much all they have in common as performers. What were the special things about Ted Danson? Well, I think you you know the 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 script that was you know I think it's no it's the cat's out of the bag that it was originally developed for Alec and Alec ended up not wanting to do it, which is fine, but um. We rewrote it a lot. Uh, we, I think a long time had gone by and I said to Robert one day, I was like, maybe we should try this for Ted because he's so amazing. I mean, obviously we knew he was amazing from everything, but also in The Good Place. And we thought, you know, The Good Place is ending soon. And uh, and we started talking again, sometimes when things feel um, kind of fertile, they, the ideas come quickly. And we were sort of in one afternoon, I, I remember, I think I was standing in, I was standing in front of the Chipotle on 57th and 8th. Where, uh, where I glamour. make my money, and um, <laughs> and uh, Colin Robert, and I went back to the office, and and we started talking about, yeah, we could change it to this and whatever, and then we and we got in touch with Ted, and he had a meeting with us, and you know, the, if you are trying to fill Alex's shoes, you really need like an American treasure, an incredible actor, an incredibly charismatic person, um, who can really carry the center of things and be great in an ensemble, and Ted is kind of one of the very very few other people that can even attempt it. But the ways in which he's, yeah, the ways in which he's different from Alec though, were energizing <laughs> as opposed to uh, It helped obstacle. guide the rewrite. It felt like, oh, we're writing a, a yeah. different thing. Uh, and that often is better than, oh, how do we move this laterally to, to, to change it? I had a professor in college who had a very brief comedy career. His name yeah. was Tom Lair. Sure. And musical songs. Yes, exactly. And uh, an uh, amazing, amazing old crankus <laughs> when he was my professor. And he had a line that was, he, he, his comedy career was like three years or four years or something like that. And then hmm. he quit and was just a math professor. And his line about that was, what's the use of having laurels <laughs> if you don't rest on them? Yeah. <laughs> The two of you are so deeply committed to not <laughs> resting on laurels. <laughs> Why do you think that is? Well, I think we both like to work. Um, right? I mean, uh, yeah. There is still that feeling that you said before, Tina, of I still feel that thing of, oh, we have it on tape. We'll always have it. Right. We did this. <laughs> uh, I still go on a set and see something that's been built because we wrote it and and a bunch of talented people designed it and put it together and it, it, that always amazes me uh also they keep paying us so yeah. what choice do we have <laughs> I, I've, I own so many tigers now it's just it's hard to <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean just the grooming right just the grooming uh, they're so adorable as cubs yeah. but then well, Tina and Robert, I'm so grateful that you took this time to be on Bullseye. I can't, I can't begin to tell you what a wonderful part of my life your work has been. I'm, oh I'm gosh. very grateful for it. Thanks for I'm having us, Jesse. It was so nice. Thank you, Jesse. Yeah, absolutely. Tina Fey, Robert Carlock, two all-time greats. You can watch Kimmy vs. the Reverend right now on Netflix. 30 Rock is streaming on Amazon Prime and Hulu. 
That's the end of another episode of Bullseye. Bullseye is produced out of the homes of me and the staff of Maximum Fun in and around Los Angeles, California. Here at my house, I got a delivery of churros from my neighbor. They made churros. They were tasty. Our producer is Kevin Ferguson. Jesus Ambrosio is our associate producer. We get help from Casey O'Brien and Jordan Cowling. Our interstitial music's by Dan Wally, a.k.a. DJW. Our theme song is by The Go Team. Our thanks to The Go Team and to their label, Memphis Industries. We've been making this show for a very long time. We have hundreds of episodes in our archives on MaximumFun.org. If you're a Kimmy Schmidt fan, check out our interviews with Ellie Kemper, Titus Burgess, Amy Sedaris, David Diggs, and Carol Kane. Uh, my apologies to anyone <laughs> who has been on Kimmy Schmidt and not on our show. Uh, it's not because we hate you. It was just an oversight, I guess. <laughs> You can keep up with us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Just search for Bullseye with Jesse Thorne. And I think that's about it. Just remember, all great radio hosts have a signature sign-off. Bullseye with Jesse Thorne is a production of MaximumFun.org and is distributed by NPR.